Um, I want to ask a very special uh, dear friend of mine, Dan Sneed, to come and join me on the platform. Would you welcome Dan all the way from California? Dan, bless you. We've got these special VIP chairs here uh, yeah. uh, in bless honor. Um, can I just stay here and sit? You can, yeah. So you can take it with you for the rest of the day, if you like. Um, Dan is a dear friend to uh, Annie and I, and he and his wife Bev are with I us. I felt much summit. better this morning when I saw Annie walk in. Thank you very much. It yeah. was just like... <laughs> um, I first met you probably early 90s. I know we don't look that old, but, you know, um, when I, I was on team at KT Bible School, I was running the KT Bible School, and one of our guys, Jamie Phillips, had mm -hmm. been at... Uh, suffering for Jesus on Kona, Hawaii, uh, on the big island in DTS, and he'd met you there. You were uh, one of the speakers that came to DTS, and he, it, it, he just said, you've got to get this guy. And so back then, we started a journey. You came over, did the first week of our Bible school, and every year then, for many years, yeah. all about identity in Christ. And we've become friends ever since. Dan has spoken into our lives over many, many years. Then three years ago, I was being commissioned as the GS here, and you sent me a text. And it was to say you had friends that were telling you that I was being prayed over that night, and Annie and I, and you, you wished us well. You said you were praying for us. But you also said something to me then about this quickening you felt that, that all about young leaders. I know that's been a passion of your life. And, and you just kind of nudged me from afar via text message to take seriously something about us, Elif and what we might begin to see for young leaders. Could you just say a little bit about that? What, what was going on for you there? I felt like, and still feel this way, that there's something that God has for Elam's future. Of course, if it's future, it's wrapped up a great deal in young leaders, but that one of the key reasons that you that God was moving you into that position I know there was an election and I know all that kind of stuff but I think God even uses that to get people where he wants them and I really felt that this was a God assignment for you not just an election one but a God assignment and a key part of that was to uh, develop and to emphasize the need to develop young leaders and when I listened last night, it more than confirmed everything that, that I was feeling. Dan, you, you, you're a Foursquare minister. Right. Um, Foursquare and Elim have a long history together. And although you minister very broadly around the world, uh, most of the leaders of Y1 would be very close personal friends to yours. You've been on virtually every base in the world they have and ministering. A lot and, of them. You know, and, and, and so a wide-ranging ministry, but, but you know, Pentecostal movements really, really well, and work with Jack Hayford, he'd be a friend. And, and what are you sensing in terms of some of the things that you think God is doing with us? We're kins, you know. They, how many of you would know that, that Foursquare and us have a long historic and theological connection, but also around the world we share many of the same opportunities and challenges, kind of a century of Pentecost on from our first founders. What do you see? What do you sense? I watched in uh, the Foursquare Church, God began to bring about a, a real shifting, we've called it reimagine, and it, uh, it, it kind of sounds like reimagine sounds kind of new and fresh, and, but what I watched is God taking us back to our foundations, but in a new way, in, with a new uh, touch on it, with a, with with a today look. And so I've, and I, as if I've prayed, I've seen the correlation between Elam and Foursquare for a long time and really felt that that's exactly what God's doing with Elam. I keep up a little bit with what's happening with you guys, but not a lot really. But there was such a strong sense of this is Elam's time, that God has raised Elam up not for yesterday, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful history. It's like Foursquare. Fantastic history of the incredible power of God. And life's transformed. But we're, we're, we're not called to just celebrate history. 
we're called to make history and that there's so much more ahead. And I really think that the, uh, with looking at Foursquare and also Elam, that there's something in our DNA that, is, that fits this generation. Now, that isn't always true of all of our structures. And I know with Foursquare, uh, we've been doing a lot of restructuring just to fit where things are today. But the, the, the openness to the spirit, the openness to new things, the openness to people, uh, the inclusiveness that is inherent in who we are, uh, it really fits today. And so I believe that there's an assignment on Elam to touch this nation, and I believe it's stronger today than ever, and that it is your, God is setting the stage for a major move of his spirit, and I believe Elam will be a significant part of that. Now, I just want to tease something out of that a little bit more because we would recognize that it's not automatic mm -hmm. that we move into that future. Mm -hmm. It's not like we, 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 God has to bless us because of that heritage and history right. alone. Right. We have a part to play, don't we? And right. Stepping into that with boldness and confidence and faith, but also humility and surrender mm -hmm. is key. There are... There's some messages that you've been carrying for some years. One is hugely about identity, and you were sharing with our younger leaders yesterday some of that. And your book on the power of new identity is available down in the, 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 the site. It, it, it's an extraordinary um, uh, teaching that, that you carry that's released many people. But there's this other word about, about pruning and about what might be necessary yeah. to bring about the greater fruitfulness. Just in a moment, could you yeah. tell us yeah. a little bit about what, what that is? I think in the last, probably the last number of years, there has been a lot of I, the word pruning. It's not, a, it's not a word most of us like a lot, uh, but it, it's crucial to growth. And I think there's been a lot of that going on. And some of it, of course, is just getting rid of the, the dead wood. You know, old methods, old ways, old things that had a wonderful past, but are no longer alive, no longer happening. I think he's also been cutting out a lot of diseased areas where, you know, you, you can't have a movement like this without picking up hurt, pain. We're great at wounding one another. And ministry is a great place to be hurt and wounded. And a lot of us as leaders, we just carry it. We just bury it because we're leaders. We go on. But, and God, I believe, has been cutting a lot of that out. But I think he's also cut out some very productive areas. But when you think about it, the whole purpose of pruning uh, requires the cutting out of productive areas because it's health and fruitfulness is its whole purpose. So when God begins to cut out something fruitful, it's, that's where new life will come. That's where greater fruitfulness will come. So I think God's been doing a lot of that and it can be very painful and often totally misunderstood. Most of the time, we really don't have a clue as to what's going on. It just seems like it's rough right now. And I think God's been doing that. I've watched God do that in Foursquare. I've watched God do a lot of that in my life. And I think that's what God's doing in preparation for a new season, a new time, new springtime, new life coming forth. And so, and with that, of course, the whole area of creating a new wineskin. And so I, one of the things that kept going over and over in my mind this morning as I was sitting over here is this question. Are you willing to give Elam back to Jesus? Are you willing to give Elam away? Not to hold on to it. We have a responsibility of stewardship. Absolutely. But above it all, it's his. He knows how to touch this generation. I don't think Elam's going to look like it does today, five years from now. In fact, if it looks this way five years from now, we probably haven't really grabbed a hold of what God wants to do. So I think there is our part. I mean, I think God's, it, God, does the, God does most of it. But there's that place I have to say I'm willing. I have to say it's your church, Jesus. I have to say, I'm willing to let you reshape it, remold it for a new season, for a new time that may not fit into what I want it to look like or what I'm used to it looking like. 
Yeah, quick question, but a, a that's sermon amazing. came out that's of it. That's great, yeah. that's great. Dan, Annie and I love you. We thank you for your input into our lives. We, we, we're so thrilled you've come to Summit this year, and, and particularly with a brief to meet with some of our younger leaders. Mm. Um, I want you just to thank and appreciate yeah. Dan. Thank uh, you. And thank you for that so thank much. You. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, thank you Chris. Elim is so rich in its friends. Thank you so much. Uh, so, we have another great friend of Elim, as Chris described him last night. Gavin Calver is going to be speaking to us this morning. Gavin is the director of, Elim, of missions at the Evangel Evangelical Alliance, uh, the chair of Spring Harvest, uh, a great friend to Elim. Let's give him a warm ELS welcome. Good morning. It is so good to be with you. It really is. And it was so amazing last night to hear Chris preaching so powerfully about the new generation. I was sat over there. And as he was preaching, I had a really strange picture. I don't get too many pictures. Don't worry, I am charismatic. Just the Lord reveals himself in many different ways to a number of us. But I had this clear picture of a portcullis on a castle. And the portcullis was being lifted up as Chris was preaching to let people in. And it got me so excited about younger generations with Elim. I ran Youth for Christ for a number of years. I worked for Youth for Christ for 14 years. I'm not sure what crime you could do to get that sentence. <laughs> but in 14 years' time, I never felt I had as much of an open goal with the denomination for youth ministry as your leader gave you last night. So right now, if I was Tim Alford, I would be absolutely delighted, <laughs> a little scared, and hoping I didn't miss the open goal before me. But let's go for it, shall we? You know, I love Elim as well. I've got, I've got to be truthful. I go all over the country. I go to all kinds of different churches. One Sunday, I'll be in a church where if I dared mention the fact my wife's ordained, conversation's over. <laughs> Next Sunday, I'll be in a church where there's a thousand people and I'm the only white person in the room. The next Sunday, I'll be in an Elim church. It'll be crazy. Then I'll be in a middle-of-the-road Magnolia Baptist Church, which is kind of the one I've placed myself in. But I'll tell you something, the same Jesus is moving powerfully. I've seen more people come to Jesus in the last few months than any time I've been alive. Things are happening. But your denomination is special. It's a special denomination. You know what you believe so you can move on. You know what you're about so you can go for it. And I'm so privileged and excited to stand before you because I love Elim. I love Elim. It's a special place in my heart. If it was down to me, I'd join you. <laughs> but you know what? I already have. Because I work for the Evangelical Alliance. And we are bigger than one stream. We want to work together to make Jesus known. But you know, the message I want to bring you this morning is very simple. We're living in choppy waters. Keep going. We're living in a hard time. Press on. You know, I'm a keen runner. I run a lot. And I've run a couple of marathons and stuff. And you know what the key is in a marathon? Don't stop. Your pace doesn't really matter. I ran one against Mo Farah. A few years ago, he beat me by two hours. But you know what? It's his full-time job. But when it comes to running, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. You run a marathon. You know what? You'll say to me later, what time did you run the marathon in? You know what my first question back is? How many of you run? Because the issue's not the time. The issue is keeping going. And as a church, the issue is not the pace, it's the destination. And do not stop. Keep going. Press on. Keep moving. We're living in a funny time in this land. They love in this country, we love to decide what the word of the year is. The Oxford Dictionary and the Collins Dictionary take it in turns to choose a word of the year. Last time it was the Oxford Dictionary's turn, they chose post-truth. When it was the Collins Dictionary's turn, they chose fake news. In both cases, I'm wondering who comes up with these. Because neither of those are a word of the year. They're both two words. <laughs> but also, my mum had one word to sum up all four growing up. Lying. <laughs> We're living in a time when it seems okay to lie. 
You know, the greatest cultural paradox of our time is there's a dictionary definition for post-truth. And the dictionary definition is this. Personal feelings are more important than objective facts. What garbage, friends, garbage. Let's play the post-truth game. How I feel, okay, I'm currently a four foot two inch Chinese woman speaking in Prague. (laughs) Nonsense. (laughs) Do not let your culture steal from you that which is true. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I was so encouraged reading The Guardian recently because they had a piece. I work for the EA, I read as many newspapers as possible. That's not true, actually. I follow as many on Twitter. Anyway, different issue. And they were debating in The Guardian recently what's going to be the word of the year this year. Do you know what the current favourite is? Vegan Jellical. A vegan Jellical is someone who's so passionate about their veganism that their passion can't help but pour out on anyone they encounter. Do you know what? I hope that is the word of the year. Because if it's okay to be that passionate about a dietary choice, it's okay to be that passionate about Jesus. So if you've got a Bible, would you turn it on? We're going to go to four quick verses in Hebrews 10. If it's any help, it's page 910 in my Bible. We're just going to read a few verses from Hebrews 10, 35. It says this. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. You know, in this passage, this was no time for shrinking back, for giving up, or for dropping out like difficult, distressed athletes. If these Christians persistently pursue the will of God for their lives, they'll eventually get what is promised. Habakkuk is quoted, who in the late 7th century BC, distressed by widespread godlessness and disobedience, the prophet cries out to God for help, and the reply was to be patient. These believers, tested and troubled, must remember that God's righteous ones live by faith. We keep going. We press on. I'm surprised at how distressed the church seems to be about Brexit, if I'm honest. It's not a surprise to Jesus. And many bigger challenges will come your way in the next 18 months. Do not be distracted by the current political landscape. Press on with what you should be doing. A couple of years ago, I had a really significant moment in my life. I was at New Wine. I'd gone there to speak, and I was in one particular meeting. My friend Malcolm Duncan was preaching. And he's preaching at the front, and he's talking about being distinct in culture. And he gives a moment to respond, to come forward. I'll be honest, I don't often respond to talks. I'm usually giving them. It strikes me as the height of preaching arrogance to give a talk and be the first to respond to your own message. <laughs> but I've gone to the front after... Malcolm spoken, and I'm stood at the front of this tent, there's about 6,000 people in it, and I feel the Lord say to me, you need to be braver in this next chapter, and I've got to be honest, I looked around the tent, and I thought, I'm doing all right compared to this lot, Jesus, (laughs) and I felt the Lord say, don't look sideways, look upwards, you need to be braver, and I stood there at the front of this tent, and I did something I don't do very often, I only tend to do it when England lose a penalty shootout, (laughs) I began to cry, And I began to cry and cry and cry. Why am I crying? Not because I'm not prepared to be brave, but because it's hard. Don't believe anyone that says bravery is easy. Bravery is hard. That's why Mandela says, bravery is not the absence of fear, it's the management of fear. And I've stood there crying, knowing it's going to be hard, and I've come away thinking, okay, Lord, I'll be braver. And I come away, I tell my wife Anne about it, no one else. At the end of the summer holidays, we're sat around with our two children praying. And my wife's much holier than me, so she introduces all kinds of holy practices into the home, and then I can go around the country talking about them on platforms. (laughs) But we're praying with our kids, and then we do this thing where we wait for two or three minutes to see if God wants to say anything. Because prayer's not a monologue, it's a conversation. And after two or three minutes, my daughter, Emily, looks up and she says, Daddy, this is really strange, but Jesus wants you to be braver. Do you know what? I came away from that thinking, yes, but not just me. 
He wants his church to be braver. There's that wonderful old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will seem strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, so I've just got three things. Always got to have three things, haven't you? I've been to Bible college. I've got three things. Three words. I think these are three ways this movement needs to hold itself in the current landscape. And the first is this, you need confidence. You need confidence. Now, We're not talking about overconfidence. If you're overconfident, you can get yourself into trouble. If you assume you can read the landscape, you sometimes get it wrong. My sister married a Brazilian guy, and um, they were getting married in America. And in America, they don't do speeches at weddings, but they asked me to do a speech to kind of entertain everyone. So I thought, what do you get if you marry England and Brazil? The best footballer ever. <laughs> Because you get English attitude, but Brazilian ability. And so, I went to the local sports shop. I bought a Brazil football top and an England football top. And I took them to this sewing machine shop. So I was going to get them sewn together with Mr. and Mrs. on the back, right? All very nice. But the woman in the sewing machine shop had complete overconfidence. She looked at me and she said, well, all I need to do, I'll just cut them down the middle, I'll sew them together, off you go. I said, no. I said, if you do that, the, the stitch will never maintain in the wash. If you go straight down the middle, you're blurring two different materials in the collars. That will never work. I said, what you need to do is you need to go diagonally across. You need to set the sewing machine up in this certain way. Use this certain stitch and do it like that. She looks at me like, where did you learn to sew? Prison. <laughs> what she didn't realize was, at school, I only got an A in one thing. <laughs> Textiles. You say, why did you do textiles? At my school, you had to do woodwork, textiles, or cooking. I wasn't allowed to do woodwork because of previous inappropriate use of tools. <laughs> Friends, I'm not telling us to come to God with overconfidence. I'm telling us to place our confidence in him now in 2019. Verse 35, do not throw away your confidence. Do not forget who's with you. You know, again, when I was at school, Princess Margaret came to open a building. And me and three other guys, I've got to be honest, we were the naughty kids. We were surprised at the job we were given. We were told to look after the car park, the main car park. After an hour and a half in this car park, we were like, where's Princess Margaret? We went into the school, we were told she'd been and gone. <laughs> she came in through the back entrance and we'd been put on car park duty, so we didn't do any naughty. <laughs> do you know what? That makes you feel terrible when you're young. You're told you haven't got access to the royal. Let me tell you, friends, we've got direct access to the king. We've got direct access to the king so we can be confident. Tim Keller says the only person who can wake up a king at three in the morning for a glass of water is a child. We have that access to God. So don't shrink back. You know, we've stopped doing gospel appeals as much. Why? It doesn't matter if no one says yes. What about all the people's decisions you've reaffirmed? What about the fact someone might say yes? We've dropped gospel appeals. It takes five or six decisions today for it to stick. It used to take one or two, yet we used to do 10 or 11 times as many as we do now. You do the maths, friends. We need to start asking people every Sunday morning, do you want to follow Jesus? And, and this strange thing we do about offending people with church activity. Take toddler groups. Over half the toddler groups in the United Kingdom are running churches. We surveyed 300 of them at the Evangelical Alliance. Most of them sing songs about the wheels on the bus, not the wise men building his house on the rock. Most of them tell stories about bear hunts, not the feeding of the 5,000. We asked why. He said, we don't offend anyone. I don't understand. If I go into the car phone warehouse and they talk to me about a mobile phone, I'm not offended. If people come into church for anything, you can talk about Jesus. We need to be confident. We need to be confident. And we need to be confident outside of the church. I remember preaching at one of these events in a park. You know when we do like church in a park, often at Pentecost? And it's really difficult, isn't it? Because there's a footy match going on, there's a cafe, and you're thinking, I want to be anywhere other than the Christian bit in the middle. <laughs> and I remember getting ready to speak, and I felt the Lord say to me, do not preach like a lion in a church and a mouse in a park. So I gave it some. At the end, some people gave their lives to Jesus. That was brilliant. Then we prayed for them and everything else, and I noticed in the cafe there was a bloke stood up. So I went over to him and said, uh, what are you doing? He said, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I said, that's good. I said, who brought you here? He said, no one. I came for a coffee and a donut. 
and his donut's half eaten, it's on the plate. I pray for this guy as I lead him to Jesus. He opens his eyes, a pigeon's eating his donut. <laughs> he says, this seems like a fair exchange. <laughs> Friends, we have got to keep our confidence. I don't like it at Christmas time when the church starts saying, oh, the world, you know, it's taking Christ out of Christmas. Because you know what? Until we've stopped taking Christ out of Christianity, let's stop having a go at the world for taking Christ out of Christmas. And let's believe he will deliver. He will deliver. I love the fact we've got so many missionaries in this country now. But a friend of mine came to Britain from Africa. He'd never been on an aeroplane before. Came as a missionary. Gets to Heathrow Airport. He collects his baggage. He's got a decision to make he's never had to make before. Something to declare or nothing to declare. So he goes through something to declare. <laughs> he says to the guy at customs, I declare that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by believing you'll have life. The guy, the guy at customs is like, you are. He says, I declare Jesus died for you. They let him in. <laughs> Have we forgotten we've got something to declare? Have we forgotten our confidence? Right now, there is a major move of God going on in this nation. We need to join in. You know, I went to preach at this church that was going on for three and a half hours. It was just such a privilege to be there. It was baptism Sunday. They had five baptisms. And the five testimonies kind of summed up how radically the Lord's moving in this land. First person was a lady from Ghana. She'd come here to study. She'd met someone at uni who was a Christian, brought them to church. She came to faith. Amazing. Second person was a, a strict Roman Catholic from Southern Ireland. He'd moved to the area for work, and one of his friends was getting their kid dedicated, so he came to church. During the worship, he got slain in the spirit. He didn't know who the spirit was. He got slain in the spirit, on the floor, having been slain in the spirit, gives his life to Jesus. He's given his testimony. You're like, wow. Then a woman gets up. She's a local she was going to see her bank manager to be declared bankrupt. She goes to see the bank manager. The bank manager's a Christian. Bank manager leads her to Jesus. Then finds a creative way for her not to be bankrupt. <laughs> then there's this Peruvian lad. This Peruvian lad came over looking for work, and he's a musician but not a Christian. Meets someone from the worship band. The guy in the worship band invites him to play in the worship band. He's not a Christian. If you've got a problem with that, discuss later. At what point did the disciples become Christians? And during one Sunday morning, leading, helping to lead worship, this lad gets convicted, comes and kneels before the lectern at the front, gives his life to Jesus. Then finally was my new evangelistic hero. This guy's homeless. Church is a big homeless ministry. This guy's homeless, and he'd given his life to Jesus through the homeless ministry. But he says in front of everyone, will you stop trying to make me not be homeless anymore? Everyone's like, what? He says, I've had it. He says, the best person to reach the homeless with the gospel is a homeless person. So stop trying to give me a home. But make me a promise instead. Promise me I'll never be hungry again. Friends, this is in Britain. God is moving powerfully. We just need to join in. When I was growing up, I thought, what's the thing I can do to most annoy my parents? So I went out the door of the local imam. Not long ago, she found a video on YouTube of me preaching the gospel. It's going to go on an alpha course. God is moving in this country. Do not throw away your confidence. Have confidence in Jesus. But secondly, perseverance. Perseverance. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? If you like any of the pictures, just go on Google and nick them. There's no copyright in the kingdom. Anyway. <laughs> well, not in preaching anyway. Verse 36. The word patience is used. This isn't a great translation. In the Greek, it's more like waiting endurance or enduring perseverance. It's keeping going when it's difficult. Don't let the state of life stop you from going from it. The world is going one way. We must go another the church is called not to be influenced, but to be influencers. We are culture shapers, not culture followers. And we hold on to what we know, even in the dark. I love that film, The Shawshank Redemption. In that film it says, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. And good things never die. We hold on to hope, we keep going. Jesus never said it would be easy. I don't understand some people's Bibles. They seem to say everything will be perfect and wonderful. This is strange teaching going on. 
that if you follow Jesus, you'll be healthy, wealthy, everything will be perfect. I don't get it. Jesus died at 33, that's not very healthy. <laughs> he didn't own anything, that's not very wealthy. Where do we get that from? There's no promise in Scripture it'll be easy. The most common, pr- 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 the most common promise in Scripture is God will be with us. So we keep going. Because it's hard, you know. And if it's not hard for you yet, it'll be hard soon. You know, let's not start getting silly. We're not being persecuted. Let's not use the P word. That's ridiculous. You want to know persecution? Go hang out in North Korea for a while. But we are being marginalized. And we have got targets on our back. And it is hard. You have to keep going. Because it's difficult. It's vile out there. I remember last summer, I put out a book review. That's all I did. 2,000 messages of hate on Twitter in 24 hours. Things about my kids and all kinds of stuff. But you know, you have to see through some of this. The, the tweet I got that most exposed the fact that we're living in such odd times was this. At Gav Calver, you are the scum of the earth and are going to burn in hell. Hashtag love wins. <laughs> These are difficult times, but we hold to what we know. We keep going. You know, um, I preach every so often at the Sun newspaper because they've got a Christian union at the Sun. And the first time I went to speak at their outreach event, I was walking through News UK. I closed my eyes so I didn't see any images that might cause me to stumble. (laughs) And then I preached. And at the end of that engagement, I met a Christian lawyer who works at the Sun. I said to him, how would your newspaper view me? He said, narrow-minded extremist bigot. I said, thank you. (laughs) I said, how do you view me? He says, child of the living God, living out your God-given calling. It made me realize something, friends. I could spend the next 10 years of my life fighting a wrong perception of me or leading people to Jesus. So so here's my embryonic theory. I'd only share this with you because you're my friends, you're Elam, so you can deal with this. It's cool. None of us are bigoted. There's not a bigoted bone in us. We're not saying that for a minute. But if the world's going to perceive you as a bigot, let them perceive you as a bigot early. What I mean by that is hold on to what the Bible says and be perceived wrongly as a bigot early doors. Too many of my friends are moving, moving, moving in their theology, their practice, and everything else. And then what happens is this cultural tsunami of liberalism moves faster than any liberal Christianity. So what happens in the end is they're then perceived as bigots too, but they haven't got the crown jewels of Christianity left. So be be clear early. Because we persevere, don't we? It's like a a hero of mine, a lady, Ladan, who's from the Iranian church. She was put in solitary confinement. She was taken away to prison. She thought she had 20 minutes left in a taxi with three others, 20 minutes taking her to prison. What did she do? She led the three people in a taxi to Jesus. Why? Because she thought it was her last 20 minutes of freedom. Friends, it's that kind of perseverance. It's not what do we not have, but what do we do have? Let's be confident and let's persevere. And don't let people mock you for it. You know, people will tell you all the time, you're not a good preacher, you're not good at this, you're not good at this. The Lord can use anything. You know, I preached somewhere, and afterwards, this guy came to give me some feedback. <laughs> you could tell from the way he walked that the feedback was not altogether positive. And he comes up to me, and he says, you've got a real gift, a real gift. So I was quite sh- taken by that, so I pretended to be humble. I was like, thank you, that's so kind. <laughs> that's so kind. He says, you've got a real gift. You've got a real gift for writing well below average books that sell well. I was like, that's rude. And so I thought, all right, stuff you. You know, if I'm honest, I do write books, so I've never made a penny from any. It goes to the ministry I'm involved in. I don't claim to be Shakespeare, but you do it to try and help people. But I said to the Lord that they stuff it. I'm never writing another book. This is rubbish. I don't do this for all. Oh, there's no wrong agenda here, but I'm cross now. <laughs> Three weeks later, I got a Facebook message from a lad. He's what you might call a backslidden Christian. He's gone home from uni for Christmas, and his mum's left my first book, Disappointed with Jesus, on his bedside table. Why do mums do that? It's like he left his cigarettes there and Santa Mum has come and taken those and left the Christian book. <laughs> he says he got so bored that eventually he read the book. And he gets to chapter 9 where I share the gospel and talk about surrendering my life to Jesus on my own the day after my 18th birthday party in Mayo Park in Forest Hill, South London. Very specific. The lad's parents live on Mayo Road. That's opposite the park. He gets to the end of the book He puts the book down, he crosses the road, and he goes and sits on a park bench in Mayo Park, Forest Hills, South London, on his own, and surrenders his life to Jesus.
that has nothing to do with me. I write well below average books that sell well. <laughs> but everything to do with still bringing your offering to Jesus, being open-handed enough. Friends, I don't mind who tells me something's rubbish. I'm going to still bring it wholeheartedly to Jesus and say, Lord, this is all I've got. Like the boys' pack lunch and a feeding of the 5,000. This is all I've got, Jesus, so would you have a go with it? Because we need to be confident in whose we are. The world says who you are is what matters. No, we are children of the living God. But we persevere because it never are we told it will be easy. And finally, we're faithful. We're faithful. You know, we live in an instant culture, don't we? When I was growing up, the most successful shop at the end of the road was the TV repair shop. Now, even if your TV is 4K, HD, whatever, if it breaks, you throw it away. My mum used to have this hanger with zips on. So if the zip broke on your trousers, she'd sew a new one on. Goodness me, who buys trousers made well enough that the zip breaks before everything else has gone? <laughs> but more seriously too, marriages. They seem a little more instant, don't they? Where's that come from? We live in an instant culture. The only thing people stick with for their whole life is their football team. And unless it's AFC Wimbledon, they got it wrong in the first place. Because <laughs> let's face it, we all understand Jesus supports Wimbledon. Because he cares about the marginalised. <laughs> those who've been mistreated and those living in exile. <laughs> but in an unfaithful culture, we're called to be faithful. Not to become like the culture, to be countercultural. How countercultural that we'll be faithful to Jesus for every breath we have left in our lungs for the rest of our days. Because Jesus is faithful to us. He doesn't call us to do much more than be faithful. So we do what we do and we leave the rest to him. It's like uh, when I was in Youth for Christ, I used to love preaching in young offenders institutes. I particularly loved it because if you ever felt like you weren't doing very well evangelistically, if you went into one of those, you came out feeling like Billy Graham. Because in some young offenders institutes, if you go in, then the lads get an hour out of their cells if they come to chapel. So they all come. And then if they respond to your message, they get 15 minutes more out of their cell. So they all become Christians every Sunday. It's absolutely wonderful. And on one particular Sunday, I, I just remember I went going into Feltham a few times. Then on a Sunday a few months ago, I was preaching in southwest London. And this mum comes up to me after and says, thank you so much, thank you so much. I'm like, oh, it's a pleasure, I've loved being with you this morning. Oh, she says, oh, not for today, that was bang average. <laughs> says, thank you for 10 years ago, when you went and preached in Feltham Young Offenders Institute. She said that my son who was in there gave his life to Jesus. And he's now on the chaplaincy team going back into Feltham Young Offenders to help young offenders. <laughs> We're just faithful, aren't we? Faithful in what we have, faithful on our roads, faithful in our communities, raising the bar on sharing our faith too. My nan, until two weeks before she died, ran Alpha in her old people's home. And do you know what's amazing about that? She would say, I can't get away from everyone. At least you can lock your door. She says, we all eat together and everything. It's like an institution. And I remember her ringing me last time we spoke about her Alpha before she died. She said this, I don't know why all the old dears won't just... Give it a go. They're going to meet Jesus soon. I keep telling them. <laughs> she says, but at least my friend gave their life to Jesus yesterday. Friends, we need to be faithful. Be faithful to Jesus. He'll be faithful to you. Stop loving ministry more than you love Jesus. Pursue a healthy, lifelong relationship with Jesus. We talk about church growth. Forget about church growth. doesn't matter. Healthy things grow. Be a healthy Christian, run a healthy church, that will grow. But we're losing stuff, we're losing stuff like spiritual disciplines. People say it's a bit legalistic, old-fashioned, everything else, to, to do that every day. Nonsense, it's a relationship. I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and, say, and ignore my wife because it's legalistic to say hello every day. <laughs> Friends, if you want relationships, you invest in them. We've got to get serious about our spiritual disciplines. We've got to not shrink back, not be destroyed because of distractions. We need to work on holiness. You know, how often do you get asked by Christians, where's the line? You're like, what line? You know, well, where's the line? How much sinning can I do before I upset Jesus? Any. We need to relentlessly pursue Jesus. Too many of my friends I was at Bible college with have had affairs, done other stuff and things, not because they were bad people, but they didn't protect themselves. Don't make yourself an island. Protect yourself. Pursue holiness. And if in doubt, don't do it. 
If there's any doubt, don't do it. Don't fiddle your taxes. Don't mess around. With respect, keep your trousers on. Don't look at that. We've got to go for a different standard. We have been given an opportunity to shine like stars in the universe. As the culture gets darker, the light shines brighter. As the culture gets more secular, the salt brings more flavor. So we, in turn, have to raise our game on being distinct and different. But as well as being faithful to Jesus, we need to be faithful to the message. Verse 38, it talks about the righteous one sticking with the message. Forgive me if I'm going to upset you, it'll be this. If you want to do one thing to stop new generations, if you want to do one thing to stop what Chris preached about last night, just go liberal. That'll be what, that'll be what, what, what goes against everything Chris said last night. Because the more liberal we go, there's nothing to join. We become magnolia wallpaper on the world's agenda, looking no different, being no different. We've got to be clear what the gospel is. You know, Max Licardo says, God loves you just the way you are. Isn't that nice? It's great. That affirms everyone. But we mustn't stick there. He says he loves you too much for you to stay the way you are. He wants you to be like Jesus. And we mustn't lower the bar on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Don't change the message. The substance belongs to God. The style you can change like the wind. And also, don't get bored of the gospel. The gospel's amazing. What God's done for us is amazing, isn't it? The fact that because of our sin and brokenness, Jesus, who is God, comes from highest heaven to lowest earth. He gives food to the hungry, health to the sick, life to the dead. Dies upon a cross, taking every wrong thing upon himself. You've ever done, ever would do, ever could do, that you could be liberated from that and know life in all its fullness now. Why are we so obsessed with death? What about now? How do I get through today without Jesus? And life in all its fullness forever. Three days later, they went to the grave. The grave was empty because your Jesus, my Jesus, defeated death that we could know life in all its fullness. When you go to the garden tomb, it was made for Joseph. Jesus was bigger. They've dug out a bit by the feet to fit Jesus' body in. I've never understood why they did that. It was only for three nights. (laughs) Home improvements should only be done with a long-term consideration in mind. (laughs) Be faithful to the message. Don't get bored of the gospel. At the EA, one of the things we do is a Great Commission hub, which is for everything evangelism you could want. Greatcommission.co.uk. And on a Monday morning at nine in the morning, we release a video of someone who's come to faith in the UK. Every few weeks, we also release one of, of someone sharing their faith. And there was this one lad, Ben, who was in year nine. And the video was of him sharing his faith at school. If you can share your faith at school, you can do it anywhere. And this lad shared his faith at school, and he talked about it. It was an amazing video. His nan didn't realize that he was doing this. And his nan went to church one Sunday night. Church was on sharing your faith. And they said at the front, we're just going to play this video from the Evangelical Alliance about sharing your faith. It's her grandson. So the nan weeps as she watches her grandson on the screen. Then when they played the video, Reg, who's the nan's friend, about six sort of chairs down from her, says, I want to be like Ben. Reg is 92. (laughs) And Reg stands up and they all start praying that Reg would start sharing his faith because he's never shared his faith with anyone. Six weeks later, Reg brings his best friend Tommy to church because he started sharing his faith. A few months later, Reg holds the towel as Tommy gets baptized. A month after that, Reg dies. It's never too late to start sharing. It's never too late to be faithful to the Jesus who's faithful to us. It's never too late to be confident, to persevere and to be faithful. You know, when I think of who who best sums up what this kind of living looks like, I'm I'm drawn to a story you may have heard me say before because it's... It's just a, a real amazing moment in my life, but it's a story from my granddad. You see, I'm from the Christian Mafia. I'm the seventh generation called Reverend, not Mr. And um, my old man started Spring Harvest, my granddad started Tear Fund. I really need a good idea. If you could help me, that'd be great. <laughs> and my granddad was a great man. He preached every Sunday till he was 85. When he got to 85, he decided it was time for what he called early retirement. And at 85, he stopped preaching on a Sunday. For the next five or six years, he had four or five strokes. It got to the point where his body was completely broken. He would sleep for 20 hours a day in a chair. But his mind still worked, but only for 30 seconds of breath at a time. His terrible sense of humor still worked too. I was around for Sunday lunch once. My grandma was explaining how the negative impact witchcraft was having in the church in Britain. My granddad was asleep. After two hours, he woke up. He said, I know all about witches, having lived with one for 60 years. (laughs) He then went back to sleep. That was all I got out of him on that trip. And it was their diamond wedding anniversary. 
the great and the good of their age group in the church had gathered in this large auditorium to celebrate this couple. Person after person paid tribute. The Bible college principal, the church planter, the Bible translator, the businessman. Person after person. At first it was fun. After a while it was like, that's enough. <laughs> Apart from my granddad, he just slept. <laughs> and it's about two and a half hours of tributes. And then the most fantastic end to it. A telegram was read out that had been sent in by Sir Cliff Richard. The telegram said that Gilbert and Connie Kirby, that's my grandparents' names, had been the most significant spiritual influence of anyone in his life. At this moment, the place went mad. There were blue rinse wigs flying. There were Zimmer frames going. <laughs> teeth coming out of mouths. <laughs> but my granddad was asleep. <laughs> so my nan got up to thank everyone. Thanks for coming. We couldn't have done it without you. It's been an amazing adventure. At this point, something dangerous happened. My granddad woke up. <laughs> and he showed that his 30 seconds of breath were upon him. So he beckoned to be called up, and he got wheeled up in his wheelchair. Gets the microphone, he says, I'm not going to thank any of you for coming. We did this because Jesus, who is God, came from highest heaven to lowest earth. Died on a cross for every wrong thing you've done that you could be liberated and set free. And I would hate for anyone here who doesn't know the Lord, by the way, less than 10 non-Christians in the building. I would hate for anyone in here who doesn't know the Lord to not have the opportunity today to, in response to what you've heard, sur surrender your life to Jesus. So if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, would you just stand up? Six people stood up. <laughs> and there's... <laughs> As they stood up, my granddad fell asleep. <laughs> Someone else had to come forward to pray the prayer, welcoming him into the kingdom. And you know what? He had spoken into microphones tens of thousands of times. That was the last time. Died a few months later. When I grow up, I want to be like Gilbert Kirby. I want to be in my early 90s, still absolutely confident in the gospel. I want to be in my early 90s, and if I've only got 30 seconds of breath, using it, persevering with what I have, not moaning about what I've lost. And I want to be faithful to Jesus till the moment I meet him. Friends, as we finish, I believe a major move of God is coming to the United Kingdom. I totally do. I totally do. I believe it's going to transform this nation inside out, upside down and back to front. The only other option I have in my life is dying believing it's coming tomorrow, but I really believe it's coming. But I also believe we live in a unique moment right now. And if I was going to only share one thing, this is what I would have shared with you today. We are living in a unique opportunity for the gospel. There's a reason for this. I was out running about nine months ago. And um, I felt the Lord speak to me. You see, 86% of people who come to faith are under 25. You know, if, you're gonna, if you've got a hole in the church roof, just stick a bucket under it. Don't stop throwing all the resources you can at youth and children. But people over 25 come to faith at junction moments. You move house, you get a job, someone dies, you get married, someone gets divorced, something happens. And I was out running and I felt the Lord say that the whole of the UK is at a junction moment for a couple of years. Because of the chaos going on, this is not a political comment either way, because of the chaos, because of all the things we can't normally, we can normally think we can depend on or turn to, they're all crumbling, they're not working. This creates a junction moment in which the openness to the gospel is off the chart. And you know what? I don't like this about our nation, but we'll be fine in five to ten years' time. We'll be absolutely fine. We'll find a way, either way, of standing on someone's neck to be okay. I don't like that about us, but that's what will happen. But for now, there's an opening. And what I would say is, of all movements in our church in this country, Elim, do not miss it. Do not miss this opening. That person you've given up on is more open now than normal. That prodigal you've stopped praying for, start praying again. That hobby you've thought about doing to meet some non-Christians, do it. Because in a year or two's time, it becomes harder again. But in the midst of the chaos, the only thing that brings order out of chaos, go back to Genesis 1, it's the Lord. The order out of the current chaos only comes through the gospel. Do not miss it. That is why I simply say to you, Elim Leader Summit 2019, press on. Be confident in the gospel persevere with what you have stop moaning about what you don't have stop moaning about the critics just crack on and be faithful to Jesus and his message as he is faithful to you and together we can play our part in transforming the United Kingdom let's pray shall we